All right, so shall we begin? Second Timothy chapter one. Um, I want to go straight into the word. Um, so this is Paul's. Obviously, it's the second letter that we have to Timothy. Not not to say that there were other. Um, not other letters, but when we look between the leather covers that we have from Genesis to Revelation, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to simply look in our lap and say, okay, turn the page. I was in 1 Timothy, now I'm in 2 Timothy. And we understand this to be Paul's last letter. It's just his last letter. Paul was about to be, he was about to be beheaded. What, what we late now know, he was about to be uh, martyred for his faith and his belief in God by the Roman Emperor Nero. So Paul wrote this letter as he awaited execution. And so let me just begin by reading the first uh, two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace, from God and the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And so as he was awaiting prison, he was writing this letter to Timothy. We remember from our study in 1 Timothy chapter 1, all of the assignment. He said, Timothy, I charge you to do this and that and the next thing. And, and so evidently Timothy had been faithful up to this point to carry out that, that assignment. But here at the end of his life, while in a Roman prison, knowing that death could come in any day, Paul's ministry had reached the end. Now, it's very easy for us to read a book like this, and we read it over and over and over, and not catch the, the weight of, of the situation right here. Think about, um, think about somebody, if, if a dear loved one or a dear friend were to contact you and say, man, it's, it's over. It's in my life, this is, this is closing. Think about that and try through that lens now to look at this letter as you read it to catch the weight and the gravity of what's being said. And so I'll try to maintain that. I'll try to remind us of that through our study in this, in this letter. So as ministry had reached the end, other Christians, we'll learn in a little bit, had abandoned him for fear of persecution. When the heat gets turned up, that old saying, when the tough get, or when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that's not always in a good way. But he continued to do as much as he was able in a, in a Roman prison. Now, when we say prison, don't think of your typical American prison with three meals a day, you know, at, at least so many square feet per person and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, yard time and canteen time and those kind of things. I recently watched a, uh, uh, a film. It was a documentary about Paul, and they depicted his, his Roman imprisonment in a, a dugout cell in the ground. So when the lid was opened up, you walked down some stairs into this, into this area that was below ground uh, uh, with very little light. Whatever light, natural light could penetrate through the lid on the, on the cell or room, that's, that's what light that he had. And so, uh, again, looking through the, uh, a, a more correct lens, understand the situation that Paul was in. And so, uh, he was just doing what he was able to do. He was writing as he was able to do. He was ministering as he was able to do. And so, we have this letter to Timothy. We find out here uh, what we already knew. Paul's spiritual son. So this whole letter takes the tone of urgency. And so you might want to write down in your notes urgency. Because as you read this, I want you to sense again, as I've already said, the, the, the overarching theme of, of just urgency. Time is short. We watched a, a, a movie the other day at home, Melissa and I did. And, and uh, you know, this young couple the, the, the girl was sick and, and the girl ends up, you know, later on you find out, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but you find out she doesn't make it. And you feel you're in that moment with that. And I was sitting over there in my chair trying to not let Melissa catch me, but I was like, man, my, my nose is running all of a sudden. Those onions earlier, 
Uh, but no, it, it, it's, it was a sense of urgency. And, and what, what, what we were experiencing by watching a film was the emotion of this is a last goodbye. This is, this is a, there's some finality to this. And so, um, again, with this, Paul, uh, you know, was, was urgent as he wrote this letter. As we move on, we see in the first three words, Paul, an apostle. Paul, an apostle. So Paul was appointed as an apostle, not by his own choice. But it goes on to say, uh, by the will of God, again, not by his own ambition or even man's choice. That's important for us to understand this day and time. Paul's role in God's plan would be to reach the world for Jesus Christ as an apostle. And historically, we can look back and see that he did. But, but we'll glaze right over something like that and, and, uh, and, and, miss, and miss what's being communicated there. Everybody has their own role to play. You may or may not be apostle. You may or may not be gifted in some form or fashion in the sense of, of the ministry. That's not to say that, that, that every single person coming uh, uh, in as part of this group of believers is not valued and valuable to the greater work in some form or fashion. I've said that so many ways so many times in, in different word pictures that I've used. But everyone has their own role to play and it's important to discover what it is and then fulfill it, walk in it by the will of God as we see in the words here. Paul was doing that by the will of God. He was fulfilling that by the will of God. Paul had his role. Timothy had his role. And we may ask ourselves, what is mine? And before you immediately jump to the fact, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not an apostle. I'm not this. I'm not that. What are you? Take inventory. And there's great value in that. Too many times people miss what's right in front of them because they're looking for the next biggest thing. And they'll say, I know I'm a wife. I know I'm a mother. I know I'm a father. I know I'm a husband. I know I'm a big brother. Uh, you know, but, but Lord, what are you really calling me to? And the whole time we're missing the point. We're missing the value of where God has established us, where he's planted us. You're not here by accident, I might add that. And so everyone has their own role to play. Later on in verse 1, you see, according to the promise of life, well, this precious promise is extended to those who believe. Are we, are you, am I, am I one of those who believe? We have hope of eternal life. We have the hope of life after death. It's also important that, to realize that we are already living eternal life. You're, really, you were living eternal life always. It's just you, you chose your destination at the moment of salvation. You secured for yourself uh, the, the proper destination, I, I would say. But, but the thing about it is, is before we die our physical death, we have an opportunity to live. So much is about dying and dying to self. And, and I'm, you know, death to this flesh. And I'm in Christ. I'm dead to sin. I've got to reckon myself dead to sin and alive to Christ. But, but in so doing, sometimes we inadvertently make the mistake of trying to, trying to, you know, when it's time to get up, stay down. And the reality is, is that, that there is a time to live. There is a time to get up and move forward and, and, and go on. And so live for the Lord. And this is what the gospel is all about. Yes, we had to die to what we were and we had to be reconciled back to God by way of the cross. But now that that death has passed, we too have experienced, uh, in a sense, a resurrection. Now we're living in the newness of life, the Word tells us. And so, verse 2 to Timothy, my beloved son, we've been through this in, chap in, in the first letter to Timothy, but let's revisit it. Timothy being a true son in the faith. I want us to flip over to 1 Corinthians uh, 4, uh, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 4. 16 and 17. Let me switch versions. I, I've got to. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Paul was telling the Corinthians this. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you, Corinthians, of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So 
So again, speaking of the relationship that, that not only that Paul had with Timothy, but also the, the level of trust that he knew he could send his envoy, Timothy, to a, to a location and to a difficult location possibly. More than likely it was. And carry out as if it were Paul in that location himself. He was a true spiritual son. And so he was a faithful son, a beloved son. And although not biological, Timothy, by Paul's own mouth, was the kind of son that a father would be proud of. And so we think about uh, that and, and, and try to catch that if we can. Typically, Paul, we see this grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. And typically, Paul would offer grace and peace to the recipients of his letters. Uh, but to Timothy and Titus in particular, he added mercy. And so I, I wrote down this question to myself. I, I put, I wonder if he did this because he knew that ministers need more mercy than others do. And then I found this quote by Spurgeon, and he said this. Spurgeon said, did you ever notice this one thing about Christian ministers, that they need even more mercy than other people? Although everybody needs mercy, ministers need it more than anyone else. And so we do. For if we are not faithful, we shall be greater sinners than even our hearers. And it needs much grace for us always to be faithful. And much mercy will be required to cover our shortcomings. So I shall take those three things to myself, Spurgeon says, grace, mercy, and peace. You may have the two, grace and peace, but I need mercy more than any of you. So I take it from my Lord's loving hand. And I will trust and not be afraid, despite all my shortcomings and feebleness and blunders and mistakes in the course of my whole ministry. Charles Spurgeon. And so grace, mercy, and peace. There's another little side note there. Uh, I don't think I'll include it tonight. It's, it's really uh, probably more something to split hairs over. And so I don't want to get into it uh, and it deals with a little bit about the versions uh, of Scripture. So in the New King James, I'll just touch on it so you'll actually know what I'm talking about. In the New King James Version, you'll see uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it goes on down, and you see Christ Jesus in reverse. And, and so that caught my attention, and I wondered, wondered what the significance of that is. And so that would take too much time to go into. Um, we might get into it just a little bit later, but Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, and, and is there a significance there? So I get on now to, to verse 3. It says, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, verse 4, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded uh, is in you also. So Paul, verse 3, all that he did, he did with a clear conscience. And there's a difference between a pure conscience and a clear conscience. You know, uh, I'm, I don't have a pure conscience. Christ had a pure conscience. I got a clear conscience because I've been forgiven. But give me, give me two seconds and I stumble again and I'll have to, I'll have, to have my... Uh, uh, business meeting with the Lord and, and confess to him my sin and, and thus need to clear my conscience again. But Paul's saying here, all of this I did, I did it with a clear conscience. He had nothing to be ashamed of. There was nothing for him to, to be ashamed of. Paul served God and did so as God led him to serve. And so just like his forefathers did, the difference being Paul had an encounter with the Messiah that his forefathers were looking for. And Paul had been arrested, beaten, stoned, and shipwrecked. And so most people would say, what have I done, Lord? I've been stoned, beaten, shipwrecked, picked on, hated, cussed at. But Paul had a pure conscience, and he knew how necessary it was to surrender his life to God. You see that sometimes, sometimes the promises are made a lot that, that if you you do this or you do that, you know, and I mentioned this before, that God's contractually bound to, to owe you something, that, that, that he has to do this. If I pay more money into the offering, then God's contractually bound to bless me more or this or that. 
But what happens when we find ourselves serving the Lord and things seem to come crashing around, uh, down around among us? That's not comfortable because we're thinking, wasn't I doing the right thing? Why are good things not happening? I'm sowing good seed and so on and so forth. And we, we get this perception that, that if I do good things, well, then that, that, that warrants God's, uh, you, know, you know, somehow he's contractually bound to me to, to dole something out. And Paul understood something different. He just said, my conscience is clear. Uh, I serve God with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. And he goes on to say, um, you know, he goes on to say there, I remember you, Timothy, in my prayers night and day. And so Paul had a pure conscience. He knew that it was necessary to surrender his life to God. And after all, he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, so Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 6, 20, he says, You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so Paul was glad to endure shame upon himself in order that Christ would be glorified. And so next we see right down here, he said, I remember you in my prayers night and day. Prayer, that was a regular practice with Paul. And, and so what's the lesson to be learned there? Night and day indicate that there was never a bad time to pray. He's saying here that he prays without ceasing. And that doesn't mean that we're not to, or, or we're not to take from that, that, that we can't stop praying or more prayer is better or longer prayer is better. But prayer should be our instant response in all situations, good and bad. Prayer is our privilege, not our post. Uh, we pray because we get to. We pray, we don't pray because we have to. All right, and so, and so sometimes uh, what's being communicated here is Paul simply saying, Timothy, I, I prayed for you night and day. Every time God brought you to my remembrance, I prayed. And from that we understand that, that, that it's not mandated uh, that, that, that three hours, four hours, certain postures, particular things like that, but just as the Lord leads you to pray, we should be instant in prayer. We should be ready to go before the Lord in prayer. And so in verse 4, it's likely that, that Paul remembered the last time they saw each other because he said, Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. You think about any, any time that, that a departure happens at an airport, at a railroad station, at a bus stop, at the end of a movie, whatever the case may be. You know, you feel the emotion of a departure that is inevitable and, and these two parties must now separate. And so Paul is looking back at that and it may have been that they, they might have just kind of quietly understood that they would probably never see each other again upon this last departure. And so Timothy had shed some tears. Not that they ever gave up a hope for a reunion in the future, but uh, which would have no doubt brought joy. But the reality was, was, um, was again, like I said earlier on, catch the gravity of this letter as it's being written and as we're reading it. So when I call to remembrance the genuine faith, how many times do we look back on a particular time that warms our heart and brings a smile to our face? A good memory, something funny, you know, a great time, a vacation, a family gathering. And so that's what's happened here. When Paul calls to remembrance, he looks back and, and he reflected and he was reminded of a real example of what was genuine, what was authentic faith. Genuine, authentic faith in Timothy. And so Timothy had the real McCoy. Timothy was the real deal, as I already read from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. Paul's memories went back to other examples of Lois, his grandmother, and Eunice, Timothy's mother. Lois and Eunice were examples that Paul could point to and say, well, if you're anything like your grandmother or your mother, you'll do fine. We do that around here. Are you, are you David's boy? Yeah, are you Mike's boy? You know, we do that around here, don't we? Same kind of thing, and, and that's what Paul's saying. He's, he said, I knew your grandmother. I knew your, your mother. You're going to be just fine because I know uh, what they passed on to you. Their credibility comforted Paul in his selection of Timothy. They had credibility because they had lived a genuine, authentic lifestyle. 
Now, what can we take from that? that? That every single day, whether we realize it or not, we're being evaluated as to our lifestyle. What I'm doing, what I'm not doing, what I'm saying, maybe what I'm not saying. Where am I at? What am I doing, what am I doing there? But the thing about it is, is, is that, that their credibility preceded them, right? And so Paul's saying that, that because of that, he took great comfort in the selection of Timothy, knowing that the difficult work that Timothy had been selected to do, uh, he was up to the task. And I could reflect us back to chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, as he said, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables or endless genealogies which cause disputes. That was a tough job that Paul left Timothy with. That was a tough assignment in a tough, in a tough place with a tough audience. But Paul knew that he was up to the task. In verse 6, Therefore I remind you, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And so here Paul was reminding of what he already knew to be true. After time passes, we know this, our enthusiasm cools. Something's new, we're fired up. Man, we're all in it. We're in it to win it. And as time wears on, the new wears off. The, the new car smell goes away. And now we're just, a lot of times we refer to it this day and time as I'm stuck in a rut. But here Paul was reminding Timothy of what he knew to be true. At this point, it can be easy to forget why all of this was necessary. The enthusiasm is no longer carrying you. Now the assignment is. Now the job is. And so it's easy to forget why this was necessary in the first place, but Timothy was encouraged by Paul not only to stay the course, but through the laying on the hands, uh, be re-energized. Fan the flame, Timothy, fan the flame. Uh, and the reason being is that some people think that Timothy, historically, theolo theologians study and say, well, they surmise that Timothy was this timid, uh, non-confrontational kind of guy. Uh, maybe, maybe Timothy had an enormous responsibility and, and the weight of that had just simply taken its toll. Maybe there was nothing timid about Timothy, but just, just the weight of the responsibility that he carried had, had, uh, had weighed on him to the point that he was just out of gas. Let that be an example to us. That, that being steadfast and immovable like Corinthians tells us, always abounding in the work of the Lord, sounds beautiful when it's preached and we shout hallelujah on the night that we heard it. But then five years come. Ten years comes. Fifteen years come. You're still a Christian. There's no noticeable difference. You feel like you're marking time. Paul says, fan the flame, Timothy. Fan the flame. Remember, this was imparted to you by the laying on of hands. Now, real quickly, there's no magic spell that comes through. Like, like if I touch somebody, it's not electricity or anything like that. It, it's a recognition. It's a formal recognition of, a, of an appointment. You know, we're, we're, we're laying hands on you, Timothy. We're sending you forth. We do that as the church. We lay hands to, to demonstrate we are in agreement here. And we're charging you with this assignment. And so, uh, Timothy, I don't think, was afraid of confrontation. I don't think Timothy necessarily was timid. Uh, I just think that this responsibility over the course of time in a tough crowd, having very little backup, so to speak, uh, over, over the period of time, I think that weighed on him. And so, and so uh, in any case, there was not room for Timothy to throw a pity party. And, and so, and we don't see anything recorded of such. Timothy had been entrusted with a job to do. Uh, we can look over, you don't have to turn there with me, but, but in four, it, later on in 4.14, he said, um, if I, in 1 Timothy 4.14, I was about to read the wrong scripture. He said, do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands by eldership. And so Timothy could be revitalized by this reminder of the day when others had laid hands on him and prayed. They trusted you then, Timothy. They trust you now. 
This is just the, you're in the long rows right now, as we'll say. You're in the long rows. And, and, and so this is where faithfulness comes in. This is where steadfastness comes in. And it's not always easy. Not always easy. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, probably everybody in this room has got that verse underlined. I know I do. Because we've heard it so many times, haven't we? God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. How many sermons have you sat through on that one verse? Many. Um, but power, the power is God's. It's God's power. And so when we do His work and represent His kingdom, we have His power supporting us. Love, many think uh, power in terms of how much we can control others, but, but Jesus' power is, in, is expressed in how much uh, we can love and serve others. Things like turn the other cheek, forgive 70 times 7. Those are acts of love. Forgiveness is an act of love. And then a sound mind. Now, now other versions uh, might even say self-control. I know the, e, the ESV says self-control. power, love, and self-control. And so calm. Being self-controlled, sound mind, being calm, being self-controlled. Uh, this being in contrast to panic and confusion uh, that, that can happen when we get into, we hear disturbing news or uh, we get in circumstances that are difficult. We remind ourselves that God's not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. That sound mind that is able to look at the circumstances evaluate them soberly and then understand that, that look, uh, this is here today, but, but like the Bible says, and it came to pass, right? And so verse 8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So therefore with this in mind, therefore... Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. This is important advice to a people whose biggest and most important figure was publicly crucified. How embarrassing would that be that the guy that you threw your hat in the ring for got murdered publicly. He was tried as a, as a criminal. So, of course we know Jesus resurrected, but when your hero gets taken out, it does seem like a huge loss. He says, don't be ashamed of me his prisoner. Uh, Paul, one of the guys who picked up the flag and ran with it, guess what? He gets arrested now. And now no longer it's not in, in color, it's not cool to, to follow this Paul guy because now Paul is not very popular. And so what is that saying to us in 2023 when everybody seems to be celebrity and, and, and it's so important to us to have celebrity status or be associated with someone who is celebrity? And so we'll name drop. We'll say this pastor or that. I, lit, I read this book. I read that book. I'm, I'm associated with this guy or that guy. Timothy was associated with Jesus Christ and Paul. Yeah. And Paul's saying, therefore, don't be ashamed don't be ashamed, Timothy. It may look uh, dreary right now, but don't be ashamed of our Lord nor of me as prisoner, but share in the sufferings. Now, here's something interesting. Paul invited Timothy to share in the sufferings. Now, I bet if I called you and I said, I'm having a party at my house Friday night. It's going to be pizza, probably going to play some games. Um, we'll just have a great time. Come on over. Come share with me in a good time. Folks might be apt to come. But if I said, come on over to the house on Friday night, I'm going to have you lay on a bed of nails, and I'm going to just cut the lights out. It's going to be a miserable time. I don't know if we're going to have power. The heat ain't on. Um, you know, it's going to be some suffering involved. Probably wouldn't. Nobody would RSVP to that. Paul's inviting Timothy to share in the sufferings. Now, what kind of invitation is that? How, how appealing is that? Nevertheless, he says, he says, take part in the things that cause pain or cause one to suffer. To stand and proclaim the gospel. Now I'm talking about the gospel, not, not all that we associate with it. 
It goes on to say here, which is the power of God, Romans 1, 16, I might add, is to confront status quo. So Paul's saying to Timothy, share with me in the sufferings as you too, Timothy, confront status quo. You come against the regular, comfortable, in the rut kind of, kind of practices where uh, it's inevitably going to bring suffering to you. Nobody's going to like that. Nobody likes being corrected. Nobody likes being rebuked or reproved, as we'll see later on. And so to confront the status quo brings the ire of those who are opposed to the message of the gospel, either by what it claims or by what it requires. And so we want to go be preachers of the gospel. Understand as you go preach the gospel, you like Timothy are going to be invited to join Paul in sufferings because the gospel requires some things of some people. The gospel makes some claims that, that upset people's belief systems. And so if you've agreed with God to be a minister of his gospel, you can, you can ready yourself for difficult times ahead. I think we can see that as we, as we look out the, the windshield in front of us in, in 2023. So verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, or by, excuse me, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And so, Romans 16.25, uh, if you will, let's flip back there just a second. Romans 16.25. And this is in reference to verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time began. Romans 16, 25 says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. I know before we've talked about this mystery, Paul revealed so many mysteries to the church and one of those was was, was this, this, this whole plan of God, this plan that we call the gospel. Out of the two, uh, he made one new man, the, the mystery of the church. All of this stuff being established before time began. God was never on his heels trying to deal with a sin problem, with a, a, an opponent problem in Satan. He always had a plan and he had it before time began. We read Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 1.4 says this, says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then in Titus 1, 2, Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised the world before time began. And so Paul's saying here, he's saying that that. Who has saved us and called us? We come to God as a response to his call in our lives. We didn't initiate the search. We do not find God. He finds us. So we must respond when he, when he calls and we sense it. So many times, I, I, you know, my own testimony is a reflection of, of him calling and, and me responding to that call. I knew very well. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something had my attention when I could feel my heart in my throat and my, my hands were gripping the back of the pew and the minister said, I'm just going to make one more call. I'm going to, I'm just, I feel like I need to wait just a little bit longer. And, and, and then it became very evident to me that God was, was seeking me. He goes on in verse nine and says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. This explains why God called us. It wasn't anything great that we were or anything great that we had done, but because uh, it fit in with his purpose and because he want to, wanted to. And so again, grace which was given to us before time began. God directed his gracious work towards us when we only existed as a fact in God's knowledge. Wow, that's pretty huge. Before time began, that's, that's farther back than I can remember. 
but, but God had a plan in place. And so uh, before time began reminds us that time is something that God created. Time itself, time um, is something that God created to give order and arrangement to our present world. So time is not essential to God's existence. He existed before time was created and will remain when time ends. And so that's why it's, we can say we will live eternally with him. It's important where these doctrines that we discover where these doctrines come from. But I'll move on. In verse 10, he says this. He says, um, I lost my place. He says, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Because of the appearing of Jesus, we know more about life and immortality than before. I mean, think about it. I, all of this was, was guesswork up to this point. You know, the occult grew in those days because people were looking for knowledge. They wanted secrets to be revealed. They wanted to know and understand stuff. But you think about the understanding of the afterlife being murky at best in the Old Testament, but then Jesus let us know more about heaven and hell than anyone else could. We think about his resurrection. We think about the story of Abraham and, and Lazarus, uh, or, or, or Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Jesus brought the truth about our immortal state to life through his own resurrection. He showed us what our own immortal bodies would be like and assured us that we would in fact have them. Jesus, therefore, a more reliable spokesman regarding the world beyond than anyone who has a near-death experience. And Lord knows, everybody that can drum up a YouTube channel has been to heaven and back in the last, in the last year or two. And they've seen, I've, I've, I don't know, but, but, but through the gospel, through the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what he did for us can be thought of as links connected together in this beautiful chain of God's work. And so God's plan of salvation before time began, continuing with the appearing of Jesus Christ, came, uh, comes to us when he saved us and he called us. And then it continues as we live out our holy calling. We have, we have this life to live. And so... Uh, one day we look forward to immortality or eternal life. And so when we consider the greatness of this message, this gospel message, it's no wonder that Paul called it the gospel or the good news. Uh, it's good news that God thought enough of you and loved you before you even existed. It's good news that Jesus came to perfectly show us God. And it's good news that he called us and saved us. And it's good news that he gave us a holy calling. And it's good news that he shows us and gives us eternal life. It's good news. The gospel is good news. I was standing in line behind a, 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 a young man uh, who was confused about his sexuality. He was carrying a pocketbook and, and the buttons that he had pinned on his pocketbook were, were of the sort that they were very confrontational. He didn't mind, obviously by his dress, he didn't mind being confrontational. And, 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 and through his actions was ready for confrontation. So, so publicly going out as a man, uh, you know, in, in this state of dress, you know, I, he would have to be prepared for that and just uh, actually looking, looking for it. And, and as I stood behind him in line, I was thinking of this. I was thinking about the gospel message is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. But I was thinking, Lord, if the opportunity comes and a conversation were to start while I'm just sitting here in line, just being in anticipation of something, let me respond in that way rather than a defensive manner because this individual is clearly much different than I am in a plaid Carhartt shirt, blue jeans and boots, and a big hat, you know, and a gray beard. It's just, you know, just polar opposites there. But I was thinking... Lord, let, let me do what you have called any Christian to do. And I was just struck with that in that moment. The power of the gospel. It's the power. I don't know how God was going to demonstrate it on that day, but I, I, I was reminded of it standing in that line. And so verse 11 says, uh, again, he says, to which I was appointed. Again, Paul going back to that appointed thing, appointed a preacher, a, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. And so Paul was appointed. He was selected 
he was chosen to be a preacher. And, and the word there, when you look it up in the Greek, is kurix. Sometimes you'll see that word used uh, uh, where apostle is, but, but he was a preacher. He was a kurix, or kerux, actually is how that's pronounced, which means to be a herald or a messenger, one who conveyed the official message of the one who sent him. All right. And then and an apostle can also mean a delegate or a messenger, but applied to eminent Christian teachers. Of course, we know that. And so Paul was this. And so teacher, one who is simply fitted or prepared or outfitted to be able to teach all of this in order to reach the Gentiles, he said, of the Gentiles. And for this reason, verse 12, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I, I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him until that day. Paul correctly identified the source of his suffering, and he was good with that. He was convinced, and, and because he was convinced in what he knew to be true, boldness followed. Have you ever been in an in a argument and you knew that you were right. And I'm not talking about the times that you were wrong and later you discovered you were wrong and you were embarrassed by that. But I'm, I'm talking about when you knew like, like the Bills 47 and the Giants 35. And you knew the score was 47 to 35 and somebody wanted to argue, but you knew you, you were convinced. Guess what happened with that convinced? You were so certain about that. Guess what? Boldness naturally increased. And so because he was convinced in what he knew to be true, boldness followed. Here's the proper order. Become convinced and then boldness follows, not the other way around. Too many times, Lord, give me boldness. Lord, give me boldness. Lord, give me boldness. I need boldness. Lord, give me more boldness. I think what we need to do is just become convinced of the message and the power of the message that it is what it says it is. And when I become convinced that what's coming out of my mouth, I'm so certain of it, I don't have to ask for boldness. Bold, boldness is the fruit of being convinced. And so Paul was like this. He said, he said I am convinced because I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him. Paul made a deposit like you would go to the bank and make a deposit. Paul committed himself. And he said, I am persuaded that what I've committed to him when the day that I need to make a withdrawal, it's going to be in my favor, in my account. It's going to be there. This day and time, we're worried about whether our money is going to be in the bank next week or not. Because after all, it's not, it's a number on a computer screen. Paul was certain that what he had deposited would be held in good trust and committed until that day. And so we too, likewise, we can put money in the bank, but a better deposit that we can make would be one where we commit to the Lord and we can also be like Paul and be persuaded uh, that, that he'll hold, hold that until that day. So he goes on to say in verse 13 then, he says, hold fast, hold fast, hang on. The pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. I would imagine, I don't know this to be true, but I would imagine Paul was one of those guys that caused you when you were in his company to up your game. Have you ever been around those people that, that, that the bar was just a little bit higher around them and you thought, man, I need to lay this silly business to the side. I, I, better, I better mind my P's and Q's around this cat because there was, a, there was a gravity about him. And so Paul's saying to Timothy, he's telling Timothy, hold fast. Hang on. Don't let go um, to the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and in love, which are found, sourced, rooted in Christ Jesus. So to hold fast that there would, that would suggest uh, that there's something that would come along and try to steal away from Timothy the truth. Let's look at Ephesians uh, 4, 14. And I'm going to read this out of the ESV. I think it communicates well. Ephesians 4, verse 14. So that we may no longer be children. So hang on to this. So that we may no longer be children. 
tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I would ask you today, do you see human cunning? Do you see deceitful schemes? We studied the Word a couple of weeks ago where now the Spirit says this, that expressly cuts straight to the chase, says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And so we, us, right now, we're not to be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine blowing. And, and think about how social media connects us in so many ways, good, bad, and otherwise. And think about how TikTok and those other platforms connect us in so many ways. And you can have a fundamental foundational belief and it will be shaken with the swipe of one thumb. Because, well, I didn't think that. And somebody very cunning, very convincing can come on that's taken the time to produce a, a 30 second or a minute and a half video can be compelling enough. It's not just their intellect that they're operating under, but it's a divisive spirit that is empowering people because the devil loves nothing more than divide, to divide God's church. He can't get at God, but he can get at his people. And so Paul tells Timothy, hold fast, hang on to the pattern of sound words. Um, we don't want to be tossed to and fro. So true teaching according to God's truth has a certain pattern. And this pattern can be detected by a discerning heart. And it's only found in Jesus Christ. Verse 14. I'm trying to get done, y'all. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. That thing is a reference to the gospel and the truth of God. And the Holy Spirit uh, says, or excuse me, Holy Spirit was and is the ability for us to be able to do that. I cannot do this in my own strength. By my spirit, says the Lord, we, we read in the word. Verse 15. This you know that in all this you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Ones, uh, Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. So let me back up and just hit verse 15 right quick. I want to go back. You don't have to. Let me read quickly from Acts uh, chapter 19, verse 10. And it says this. It says, This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now from the book of Acts, we have the record where all in Asia, modern day Turkey, heard heard the word of the Lord, Acts says, both Jews and Greeks. Then we get over here to 1 Timothy, we see, this you know that all those in Asia, all those in Asia have turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. And so we learn that all the residents of Asia heard, that's uh, not to say that they responded in Acts, they heard the word of the Lord. We picked that up in Acts. Maybe they didn't respond. But here there are two particular individuals named. They may be named in reference to all those who turned away from Paul as if it's a surprise. Kind of like saying, well, no one saw that coming. I thought everything was good. These two might have been among the most trusted by Paul. If this is the case, then let us learn an important lesson here, and that is to never take your foot off the gas, never operate on autopilot, never assume anything. But in any case, these two notable men were among those who turned away from Paul and were not faithful and an example of those who did not do as previously charged, and that is they did not hold fast. They were persuaded in a different direction and they turned away from Paul. And then we get on down. Uh, we've got this other character here named One uh, Onesif. I've said his name a hundred times so I wouldn't get here and mess his name up. And here I am messing his name up. Onesiphorus. Thank you. I said Onesif 
for us and I've jacked it up. But anyway, the Lord grant mercy to his household for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. And so the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord. In that day, there's a day of reckoning. His name means help bringer. Help bringer. And so On Onesiphorus, it's the last time I'll try to say it. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus was a different sort of man. He was different than Phygelus and Hermogenes. He was different. He was, you, you have a comparison being laid out right here, and let's not miss that comparison. You have those who did not hold fast, but one who was faithful. And so the Bible lays that out for us. We can, we can say, gosh, I want to be more like this guy than those two guys. I mean, at face value, we can read that and say, that's more important. Uh, that's the better choice of the two. And although we don't know much about uh, Onesiphorus, other than he lived near Timothy, because at the end of the letter, Paul asks Timothy to greet his household, and it might have been a, a, a church in his house. But Paul described these things that makes him special. He refreshed him. He was not ashamed of his chain. He sought him out uh, very zealously, and he found him. And, and so Paul's prayer for this, this individual is that he may find mercy in that day. And he goes on to say, and you know very well how many ways he ministered to us at Ephesus. And so his name is forever remembered and recorded in, in Holy Scripture. So um, uh, very important character. It's easy to overlook that, but looking at what he did he was doing exactly, he was, he was taking fellowship in the suffering like Paul was encouraging Timothy to do. He wasn't, he wasn't concerned that his image may, may, uh, may be, uh, you know, looked down upon, that, that, that he wasn't going to be with the cool kids necessarily, but he was, uh, what was the most important thing to him was, was what he was recorded for here at the, at the end of the chapter. And so, again, Yet another example. And so from this, our takeaway is just what can we learn by the behavior of those who have gone before us? And how can, how can I see these lessons, these hardships that others have endured, and how can I stand on their shoulders and maybe not have to suffer like they did, although, although we'd call it suffering this day and time. I mean, after all, if, if the hot water runs out, we call that suffering, right? But... but Nevertheless, the point being is that we have an opportunity to, to stand on these men's shoulders and to, and to take this and go even further with it. And so may the Lord teach us to do that tonight. And so what would otherwise seem like a simple chapter that you've read dozens of times, there's, if we'll slow down long enough and, and discover, there's so much to be learned from that. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this letter the urgency of this letter. Lord, I just try to imagine the, the emotion, the, 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 uh, uh, just the heaviness of, of, of the words that were written here that, that we have in plain English, but undoubtedly, Lord, communicated so much clearer to Timothy in that day, Lord, where, where the situation, the environment, the surroundings were, were such that these words carried so much weight. Lord, help us to feel the weight of these words and then take uh, a proper response according to that. I pray that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.